This is Jason Hoffer from GoingThroughVinyl.com in conversation with Harold Budd, recorded May 3rd, 2012. You can check out more interviews at GoingThroughVinyl.com. Hope you enjoy it. Um, I'm going to get right to it, if you don't mind. Yeah, let's do it. It's good. My next guest is one of the most recognized and celebrated ambient pioneers in the world. Harold Budd has established himself in the underground music scene as playing some of the most haunting, meditative, and beautiful music known to man. His unique, hushed piano improvisational soundscapes further blur the lines between what rock, jazz, and classical music is. After being accepted in both the avant-garde and minimalist schools, Bud never wanted to dwell on the past, rejected the teachings to explore his own path and new structural possibilities. Together with Robin Guthrie, John Fox, Gavin Bryars, John Hassel, David Sylvian, Daniel Lenoir, and of course Brian Eno, Harold Budd has cemented himself in music history by putting out some of the most groundbreaking and important albums in the last half of the century, and I'm honored to have him as a guest. Welcome, Harold Budd. Well, that's a very nice thing to say. Are you sure? Are you sure you're right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sure I'm right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's said that a person's surroundings affects how that person sees and understands the world. I have visited and spent some time in northern Canada and can tell you that people there are very different than the people, say, from a larger city. People there have skills and a deeper understanding of the power of nature. You grew up around the Mojave Desert as a child. What was it like growing up there? What was it like? Yeah. That's hard to put into words. I mean, I mean... To me, I, I didn't have anything against, uh, I didn't have anything to compare it with. Hmm. It, it seemed normal to me. Uh, that's, that's the way people were. It wasn't until, um, well, I split time between there and, and uh, Los Angeles proper. And uh, uh, it's, you know, they, they were, they were, I don't, I don't know. It, it, it just seemed all normal to me. It, it, it wasn't like uh, I was registering on what it was like to grow up there, you know? Yeah. The first album, Pavilion of Dreams, was recorded, yeah. in, was recorded in 1978 and consisted of stuff dating back that you composed back in 1972. You have a, yes. You have a very distinct and unique piano style, almost the essence of ambient music itself. Huh. Your, your sound must have been formed at least as early as 1972. How early? Yes, 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 it, it was. I'll tell you how that came about. I had a, um, I had a performance, um, let's say about 1970, oh, oh, I don't know, early 71 or something like that, uh, with, uh, it was a performance, live, live performance of Montreal's of the Rose Angel. And uh, it was a disaster. I, I wasn't there. I, I just heard heard a tape of it. It was done at uh, uh, NYU, or no, no. Um, what was that um, area called? Uh, it was in Buffalo, New York. It was one of the state colleges of New York. Does that ring a bell? Is, is that, uh, uh, does that make any sense to you at all? Not really, no. Yeah, that's, it's, well, it's okay. Anyway, it was it was awful. I just cringed listening to it, and I thought to myself, you know, listen, if, if I'm going to get serious about uh, going on as a composer, um, I've got to take full responsibility myself. And I learned, I, I had a piano in, in my uh, home, and uh, it was just sitting there because it that, that was, it was really in storage. I never played it. But I started to play it, and uh, kind of uh, by default formed formed my kind of soft pedal style, and uh, it's the only way I can play, and it's the only thing I can play. Let me tell you, uh, I'm not uh, I'm not a musician in the uh, uh, you know in the uh, sense of the word that uh, I am, am skilled at, at a lot of different things. Because I'm not. I'm absolutely not. That's interesting. It seems to me that your m music almost has a narrative or conveys some message. How do you start uh, writing, uh, and do you have a vision before you begin? 
no, no. It it, it has it has no message. It, it is a, absolutely neutral in that regard. It, it is just itself. That that's all. I'm I'm not conveying anything. Hmm. When was the first time you remember hearing the word ambient? Oh, that was a word invented by uh, Brian Eno. Um, I, I have nothing to do with the uh, formation of that word. Uh, that's that's that, that was his thing altogether. I know I'm I'm slammed into that category, whatever it is, but I feel like I've been kidnapped. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, and kidnapped into uh, into something that I don't know anything about and have no interest in at all. So, uh, so ambient is um, just one of those words that kind of comes and goes. It's a hell of a lot better than new age. <laughs> I agree. But thank God that's disappeared. Yeah. Well, I don't think what you do is, you know, new age. I think they're actually very different. No, I don't. I don't either. It just it it used to it used to tick me off so much back in the eighties that I would I would go to record stores and uh, <laughs> try to try to force them to put my vinyl in a, in a different category altogether. <laughs> I just confessed to them that I was embarrassed as hell. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good thing that uh, when people don't know where to put what classification that person's in, that I think that well, that's on a good, you know, you're on a good path then, if that makes sense. Well, I'll take your word for it. I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, um, the ambient world has kind of taken a life of its own. Do you ever listen to any of it? Any? No. Any, no, eh? No interest? No. No. Now, you're not only a pianist, but you're also a poet and a painter. You were inspired at one time by painters like Mark Rothko and others. What is it about those painters, and how do they affect your work? Well, I'm a, I'm a great fan of, uh, generally, of, of paintings in particular. And, and they move me spiritually in a way that uh, music seldom does. It's very rare that, that music actually grips me in the same way that a painting I respond to does. And back in the 60s, when, uh, when I confronted Rothko for the first time, I, um, I mean, it's become a kind of a cliche now. Uh, Rothko was so celebrated and so famous and all of that kind of stuff that, uh, in a way, he doesn't even own his reputation anymore. But... For for me, it was uh, it was very liberating because, uh, in a way, I, I misunderstood his paintings. Um, I thought I, th I I thought they were just confrontational and direct, and without nuance. And in a way, I still feel that way. But no one else does. They're all talking about you know his subtlety and and the spiritual blah, 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 and they go on and on at great length about things that uh, I haven't a clue what they're talking about. Um, but funnily enough, I think it was in 1966, 67 maybe, I, I went to New York for the first time, and I became acquainted with uh, Morton Feldman. And, oh, okay, let me back up a second. Um... In 1963, I sent Rothko a orchestra score called Analogies from Rothko. It was one of my first, it was my first orchestra piece, and pretty close to being my only orchestra piece. Obviously, that's back in the days when I was a note composer. And I sent it to uh, Rothko's gallery, which I believe was Marlboro in, in New York City, and... Uh, I didn't, I didn't, uh, oh, I know, I know what I did. So, I'll be damned if I didn't get a letter from Rothko saying how immensely surprised he was to get this thing. And he showed it to his friend Morton Feldman and asked Feldman if there was any way he could translate it sitting at the piano and show him what it sounded like. And Feldman said, no, he can't. It's not that kind of music. Hmm. So, when I went to New York... Um, I called up Feldman, and he said, you know, let's, let's get together. 
uh, right away. And, you know, um, Roscoe would r really like to meet you. And I thought, wow, well, wow. it's very cool. So I'll be damned if uh, we didn't meet up at Roscoe's studio on, um, it was in the East 50s somewhere. It was a big, uh, big place. And he was working on the Roscoe Chapel. And so I got to see them in progress, which now is truly amazes the hell out of me. Hmm. But at that time, um, you know, they were, I just thought they were Rothko paintings, and uh, he, uh, he was working away at it. And he took time out, and we drank scotch all afternoon, and I got absolutely pissed. <laughs> I was just blinded. But it was the most wonderful afternoon for a young composer to uh, confront two of his heroes, uh, Feldman and Roscoe, and sit around shooting the shit. You know what I mean? I, I don't. I wish I did, but yeah. Sounds... <laughs> that doesn't happen very much. <laughs> no. I'm sure there was a lot of cigarette smoking going on then, too. Yeah, yeah, everybody. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yes, I was a heavy smoker myself. Oh, yeah. Everyone was. I mean, it was the 60s, you know? What was, I mean, okay, I gotta ask you, I'm totally getting off topic here, but okay, Rothko, what was he like? Because, you, you know, you read the... the... He was an ab absolutely gregarious, charming gentleman. He, he was very talkative, and, and uh, he, he wasn't shy about anything. He, he just gabbled on and on about this and that, smoking cigarettes, drinking scotch. Um, so he was sitting at a outside table, you know, all fresco um, for lunch, um, never giving up for a second. I mean, just hacking away at uh, at uh, you know a general conversation. And uh, uh, Felton also, you know, is a very gregarious, <laughs> open person, yeah. and um, I. I was not so much. I mean, I was I was a little bit hesitant about uh, a lot of things. Yeah. So I knew my life was changing radically, and um, he was uh, so so. Rothko was a charming, gregarious, open, friendly, friendly, friendly person. Period. He wasn't depressing like the media always seems to. Absolutely not. No. 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 Mm -hmm. That's just, true. just the opposite. A real, uh, a real mensch. What, is, what do you think it is about? Because I mean, whenever you study history, it seems like there's an art movement first, and then often it's like, you know, twenty, thirty years later, then the music happens. Um, but for some reason, that time period, the, uh, I guess it's called the expressionist movement. Um, you had people like Morton Feldman and John Cage and people like that that were seemed to be right with that and, and hanging out with those people. I get, and, and I include yourself in that, actually. Um, you know, I've, I've often thought about that, and uh, I haven't arrived at any satisfactory conclusion at, at all. Um, you know, there's a, the old saying of Voltaire that history is made by... It, History is the lie that historians agree on. And, um, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't think much beyond anything as simple as that, to be honest with you. Now, I recently posted an interview with Christian Wolf where we talk about yeah. John Cage. Um, mm -hmm. And I was reading that you went to a lecture given by Cage. Can you talk about that? Yes. Um, I went, it, it's the first confrontation with Cage. It was, um, he and David Tudor, uh, gave a lecture in Los Angeles called, uh, Where Are We Going and What Are We Doing? And, um, it's, it's printed in silence, as a matter of fact, so it's not very obscure. And, uh, I thought to myself, my God, these... This guy is into something uh, radically uh, other than uh, the received convention that, that I had been uh, fighting against with, without any real knowledge about uh, what to do about it. 
you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it was uh, it was kind of life changing in a way. Not life changing like coming across Roscoe for the first time, but life changing none- nonetheless. I mean, it. Uh, um, I never went back to to uh, uh, kind of square music. But you have to understand that I didn't begin my music education formal until I was 21 years old. So uh, I was I was a young composer, but not young in years, if if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, so I was getting mature enough to uh, kind of take things seriously. And Cage seemed to me to be uh, uh, something beyond just the kind of uh, oh, garden variety uh, academic music uh, scene, which which I hated anyway. I, I I didn't respect it very much. Yeah, yeah. So it it was it was quite quite eye opening. And uh, from there, I met I met kind of similar uh, other composers who uh, were of the same mindset, I guess you would say, uh, anti-establishment, I suppose you'd say, uh, like uh, uh, Daniel Lentz, who was, you know, became my best lifelong friend, still is, uh, Barney Childs. And at the time, at the time, Larry Austin was starting to publish his uh, Source Magazine series, and um, so I, I, I kind of you know hooked into a alternative um, avant-garde music scene that I really didn't know existed because in Los Angeles at that time it was very backward and very. I mean, nothing was happening. However, it's not quite true, but I didn't know about it. The uh, Southern California painters were very, very happening. But I didn't know it. No one else knew it. There was, you know, Billy Al Bengston, Ed, Ed, Ed Ruscha, for example, two examples. They were, they were changing things radically. They were making a serious break from abstract expressionism. Um, in my studies of music, there was a moment in time, probably starting off with Carl Stockhausen, but continued with people like Brian Wilson, Jimi Hendrix, Frank Zappa, and the Beatles, where musicians mm-hmm. started to use the studio as an instrument. I remember reading um, that a watershed moment for you was when Brian Eno showed you how to do that. I guess, first off, what does it mean exactly to use the studio as an instrument, and how did it change your work? Oh, it changed my work radically. Um, and I give all, all credit to Eno for that. He didn't, he didn't show me how to do anything. He, he, he expressed an attitude about how things are done, and that's all it took. I needed... I needed that like uh, I needed uh, I needed a, a lifesaver. Eno seems to be a lot of his concepts seem to be rooted in the John Cage school, I guess, if you will, and he kind of just makes it current. I guess. Do you would you agree with that? Well, there, there there's nothing strange about saying that um, almost um, every composer of my generation has been. Uh, at one time, early on, anyway, affected by by John Cage. It's not to say that um, it was. It's not that. It's not to make a value judgment. It's just to say that uh, it was inescapable. It was part of the the, the paradigm. It was part of the uh, fabric of uh, being alive as an artist and as as a. Yeah, well, okay, as an artist at that time, period, you know. Um, and and there's, there's nothing mysterious about that. 
everyone, everyone uh, was like that. At least the ones that I admired and thought were doing something interesting were, were certainly into that. Yeah. I remember reading uh, in an interview that Philip Glass did where he once said that the thing that separated him from other talented composers, he was actually referring to students at the time that he was going to school with, that set him different was uh, that he set time aside, usually I think four hours every morning, to compose. Are you a person who composes with a structured timetable? No, just the opposite. I'm completely undisciplined. So you, you wait for um, inspiration to hit? Yep, I do. And I can count on it hitting at a, just, just, when, I, just when I need it. <laughs> that's, that's, that's nice. Yeah, uh, it's very nice. Now, I'm a big fan of your work, and some of your albums um, marks specific times in my own life. I'd like to go over some of your records, if you don't mind, and see if you have anything to say about them. Sure. Of course, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Brian Eno put out a series of LPs featuring different artists known as the Ambient Series. The first in the series was titled Music for Airports, and <laughs> it had a purpose behind it. The idea was it would be played at airports to relax passengers. Ambient 2, The Plateau of Mirror, 1980, has you playing piano to treatments by Brian Eno. Um, can you right. please explain the uh, concept of the album, if there is one? Well, understand, first of all, that it wasn't called ambient insofar, I mean, is, insofar as I, I was concerned, ambient had, I mean, it was irrelevant. It was uh, really just documenting two ideas. One, the way I play piano, which is, uh, as, as you know, is kind of low skill, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, non, non-athletic, shall we say, you know, you don't have to have good, good, uh, facility at the keyboard. You just, you know, it's my style. And then Eno's, um, you know, he said, um, he said very early on, he said, you know, like, uh, Harold, let's, uh, let, let's col- collaborate on an album. You, you, you play the way that, you do, and I'll play around the way I do. And we had no plan, and it was not going to be uh, uh, anything particularly noteworthy. It was just a, a documentation, really. And uh, so it was. That's, you know, but it turned out to be, you know, like uh, rather surprising, right? <laughs> well, I, th- I mean, I think it's a masterpiece, really. Um... <laughs> so, but but, 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 sorry. That that's all, all, all there was to it. There, there, there was no plan at all. Period. It's funny also that you you keep referring to your playing as um I don't know. You seem to down downplay it in a way, which I don't understand. Oh, I do, I, I do because I'm not a proper keyboard player or, or pianist at all. I mean, I, I'm 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 serious. I'm, you know, I. I can't play the piano. I can play what I do play, but that is all. You know, I'm not. I'm not a, a musician in the in the uh, orthodox sense of the word at all. I guess, but it, I, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, and does it does that matter? I mean, you can do, you can put out not. some amazing no. albums, no. and so no, no. I think that of course it does. It, yeah. No, it, it it doesn't matter at all. No, um, no, I'm I'm I don't mean to sound like I'm denigrating what I do because uh, I'm, but it's it's it's, uh, but what I do is is uh, the only thing I can do. And if I didn't think very highly of it, I wouldn't do it at all. Hmm. If that makes any sense, like uh, uh, let's see. Trying to think of an analogy, but uh, I can't come up with one. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll sit on it. Um, the, All right. <laughs> the, the album The Pearl, 1984. Once again, yeah, right. you and Brian right. Eno, and now yeah. credited Daniel Lenoir. Well, because we recorded it in uh, at Lenoir's 
studio in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. Right. Yeah. And and um, um, Daniel was uh, very instrumental in coming up with uh, good decisions and uh, ideas and uh, criticisms and editing ideas. That it was um, only only good to uh, you know uh, make it make it obvious that uh, he, he, he was more than just a passive uh, engineer. Yeah. How, how, what kind of a role did his brother have? None. Hmm. Nice guy, but none. Yeah. So Brian Eno and Daniel M. Watt later went on to record some very popular albums uh, for U2. <laughs> did you see some sort of I guess magic or some sort of thing between those two, as far as playability. I I, I don't know. Do no, I'm I'm completely divorced from that world. I don't know anything about it. Hmm. Do you do you know where the title "The Pearl" came from? Yes, it's from uh, uh, it's from uh, Lanois. He he mentioned um, after we did. Uh, is there a piece called "The Pearl"? Yes. Yeah. Okay. After that piece was recorded. Dan said, you know, that piece is a little pearl, and uh, it stuck. So that's, <laughs> that's that. When are you working with them again? Well, let's see. With, with, uh, with uh, Daniel? Or, or Brian Eno. Is there any plans? Oh, there, there's, there, I, I, don't, I don't think we will. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, well, look, we've, we've already done... What we've done, that's, that, that's, you know, that's good enough. I guess so, yeah. I don't know, just, I, I really enjoy when you guys get together. It's always a magical album for me. <laughs> Thank you, that's nice to say. Okay, uh, Lovely Thunder, 1986. One of my favorite albums right. of yours. It was produced but, by you and a guy by the name of Michael Honig? Hon- yes, yes. Um... um uh, I, I recorded it in the uh, uh, Little Tokyo section of uh, Los Angeles, and it's um, M- Michael Honig. Uh, you probably don't know very much about him, but guys from my generation know a lot about him. He was he was from the the Berlin school that included uh, Tangerine Dream and Popol Vuh, Rodelius, uh, you know, guys guys like that. And uh, Michael had a uh, uh, a good studio in Little Tokyo, like I said, and uh, he was a brilliant engineer. And he's no longer living in L.A. any longer, so he's gone into retirement on the island of Ibiza. I don't quite know how to talk about this, except to say I feel very bad, uh, sort of guilty, with regard to natives and what was done to them. There's an image in the back of By the Dawn's Early Light, 1990-91, that sort of speaks to that in multiple and striking ways. Uh, Was that sort of thing that was really... No, 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 no. It has utterly nothing to do with that at all. It's, it's, It's not sociology. And, and it's it's not speaking to anything at all, except for it was uh, the first album I did upon my return from uh, living abroad. I lived in in London for a number of years, and when I came back to uh, Southern California and and settled in here, um, I kind of uh, was reintroduced to my own culture. Uh, you, by I mean, I was looking. I was reading the novels of uh, William Burroughs, uh, the plays of Sam Shepard, uh, the films of Terence Malick, things of that nature. I I completely, once again, hate to be re- repeat myself, fell in love with the uh, romance of my own uh, culture, the history of my own culture. After a number of years being divorced from it and uh I took advantage of that. I, I thought I thought there was a vast part of myself which had not been uh tapped and um I set about to do that. 
So, but it, 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 had, it, it has nothing to do with uh, Native American culture, per se. Uh, the gunfight at the OK Corral or any romantic stuff like that, it, it just doesn't exist. So, but I mean, I, I guess I was speaking to the, there's a, um, a picture in the back of it called the cat, the captive white boy, Santiago McKinn. Yeah. Yeah. That was beautiful. Yeah. I know it's a really remarkable photo. The reason I used it and the reason I saw it was because, um, I opened up the LA times one morning at breakfast and there was an article with that photo saying it was being sold to a Japanese, uh, collector. And it was being, it was leaving America forever. And I thought to myself, you know, this is this is a real pity. I mean, this is this is scandalous. You know, like it, this this photo should be uh, an icon of uh, Western American lore, and in a place where everyone can see it. And it was disappearing, and I uh, uh, reacted to that very very strongly. And uh, I was able to get a get a first generation copy before it left uh, California from the uh, art gallery that owned it. Let's see, as I recall, it was uh, it was sent over by it was sent sent over to Warner Brothers Studio with uh, with guards. You know, they they wouldn't let it out of their sight, and a photograph was taken of it. And it was used in, on the album, yeah, it's awesome. which is sepia tone, you know, uh, old old fashioned uh, uh, technology. It's a it's a real view, absolutely beautiful. And as much as I have been in and out of Arizona, I've never been down to Tombstone, Arizona, which is where it was uh, shot. Yeah, it's it's a haunting image. It's, it's a great. It is. Yeah. Ab- absolutely stunning. And it it really rang a bell with me, yeah. but 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 that's it. You know, it's it's more about it. It's not, uh, you know. Well, it's, it is what it is. Period. I remember when I first discovered this this album, I centered the whole album based on that image, and it it, it sent me off in a completely different direction. The photo of Santiago McKinn. Yeah. Uh, can, boy about the boy about ten was me. Can you talk about that poem? Uh, you know, in poetry, you just bring up images and write them down, and that's all it is. I was I was living in Victorville at the time, and I was uh, just reminiscing really on the life that my brother and I led in that. Uh, kind of uh, isolated place. The album Translucent and Drift Music are done with John Fox, who was the lead yes. singer of Ultravox. Right. Can you tell me a little, about, a little bit about those albums and how you came to work with him? Oh, uh, John has been a friend of mine for ages. And um, we get along really well. And I've always wanted to work, work with him and... Uh, uh, I saw to it, and John saw to it that uh, all that came to pass. You know, we 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 just came together and did it. Um, that's about it. I mean, there's there's very much. Well, I'm a great admirer of John, both yeah. Johns, the rocker and the uh, and the uh, and the singer. Oh, that first album of Ultravox is great. I mean, it's very different than their later stuff, but which I also like. But that first album is is killer. I never knew John in those days, so I don't know. How did you come to meet him? Well, let's see. I was living in I was living in London, and he was living in he was living in London. And um, oh, I know how we met. It was through uh, the painter Russell Mills. He uh, it was. Uh, a mutual friend of uh, ours, and uh, he was responsible for introducing us, you know, at a, what was it, you know, like at a concert or, or a dinner or something, I can't remember, it's, it's lost back there in the, right. in the Paleolithic somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, it's pretty well documented that you've been known to go into retirement. The last one I know about dates back to just after the um, album Alvin Sutra in 2004, where you famously said, I have all I said that I needed to say. Um, what was it like writing your yes. final piece? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, it, that, that is all a, a terrible mistake. I didn't mean any of it. I, I was uh, I was having a terrible, terrible uh, time, and uh, I had just given up on everything. And I, I I just I just laid low for a while. But it wasn't really what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, I made it public, and uh, that was a very foolish thing of me to do. So. Um, I, I can uh, I can only say that uh, I I regret that whole part of my life. Because hmm. I mean it's a fantastic album, by the way. Um, do you find that you work... I, I, I like that album too. I'm, I'm I'm very very happy with it. And I there was a long time in there where I couldn't. Oh, I was having such a difficult time, and uh, I thought it was a really good album, a good strong album. And a mutual friend, a, a mutual friend of David Sylvian's and me, got us together for lunch in L.A. Uh, this was about twelve years ago, and David said he would uh, he would like he would like me to consider giving him the album and having it earn some money. That's the way he put it. You might as well have it earn some money, uh, you know, while you're just kind of brooding about things. And I thought, well, this is a very sensible idea. In fact, it's a very good idea. And so, sure enough, there it is. I gave it I gave it to David and I'm... I'm so happy with uh, what what happened. His, his his production value is so acute and so um, uh, sensitive and art driven. You know, he's he's a he's a he's a true artist. That that guy. I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, he seems to be surrounded by people like that. I mean, yes, yes, I, I, exactly, and and I think he's very careful. I I don't know if he's careful about that or not, but he's he attracts a, a kind of a person in, into his sphere that, uh, um, and 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 they're all attractive to him, and uh, and uh, and they're attractive in their own separate ways. It's 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 very nice, very very nice indeed. You know, he, he lives here in America. Really? Yeah. He lives in New Hampshire. Wow. I, 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 yeah. I, I can't even see him. I mean, it would be, it just seems, I just always assume that he'd be in, you know, Europe. He never seems to travel or uh, seems to tour North America. He only tours Europe. I'm s- <laughs> cause I, really I don't blame wa- him. I, only wanna, I really want to see him, but he never tours. He's, he's, no, on, he's on a tour right no. now, and it's only Europe. Yeah, good. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> Why touring, say- uh, touring America is not something that I'm in the least interested in. I've I've turned down stuff to uh, avoid avoid playing playing in America. Why is that? I just don't think it's happening here. Really? Eh? I think I I think it's. Uh, Look, look. It's it's very simple. I, you know, it, it sounds like I'm uh, have a grudge, but it's not quite quite true. But I had to leave America in order to start making a living, and uh, because I had decided that I was not going to be a college teacher any longer, and that I was going to uh, do what I do and do it the best I can, and if I fail, well. It's not because I didn't try really hard, and uh, I did try hard, and it wasn't happening here, and I had to go to, uh, and 
the minute I, I, I moved to Europe, I started to make a living. And that's, you know, what can I say? And I had a family, a wife and two uh, children growing up, growing, you know, like young children here in America. And, um, you know, I was able to su su support them as well. For I, I didn't do a very good job at that. Is it that you think that, I guess, North America doesn't, I guess, support high culture? I have no idea. It's, it, it's, 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 it's not an issue that really concerns me, you know. I, yeah. I don't care if it does or if it doesn't. Yeah, you don't tour, like, hardly ever, do you? I tour in Europe. Man, i got to move to Europe. Yeah, although I haven't done that in some while because yeah. of uh, other issues that are more pressing right right at the uh these days oh, okay well i hope everything's okay it'll uh, be all right robin guthrie is a guy you've worked on and off with for probably more than anyone else uh, mm -hmm. he was a member of the cocktail twins mm -hmm. you obviously work well together and continue putting out albums what is it that you like about working with him Uh, uh, well, he's a very close friend of mine, which is, which is a good start, don't you know? And he, uh, I don't know, we just click, you yeah. know, we get together and suddenly, and, and we know exactly what's going to happen roughly and, you know, uh, we just know exactly what to do with uh, one another and we have no trouble doing it. Hmm. Really, a nice idea, and when something like that happens, you know, you of course you do it, do it some more. And I intend to do it some more. I'm I'm going to uh, make plans uh, with Robin. Robin has invited me and my young son. <clears throat> I have a I have an 11 year old son oh. from a separate marriage. Okay. And uh, he's been to Europe one time, but he's never been to France. And uh, Robin and his family has invited us over. And uh, I'm going to take advantage of it this summer. And we're going to, uh, Robin and I is going to finish a, uh, oh, a little EP, I think, that we began two years ago and haven't worked on since. So I'm looking forward to that a lot. I love working with him. It's it's really, really a cool thing. He lives in France, by the way. Okay. Yeah, is your is your son into music? I, I didn't get that. Is your son does your son like um music? Oh my son. Yes. <laughs> no. Uh I would n not not particularly. He's you know, kind of like all really young kids. He's you know, a preteen, and, uh, you know, it's, he likes, he likes music, but he's not nuts about it. He's, uh, he's really into the sciences, and, uh, he's a voracious reader. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, I think it's very cool. Um, okay, In the, In the Mist is one of your newest albums. And you use yeah. strings on it in an interesting way. Can you talk about the song? Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. Um, yeah, this comes as uh, this idea about writing uh, music for strings began back in 2000 when uh, um, the first two pieces I wrote for strings. Look, I had a piano in my house, and I hated it. I hated piano in my house, and... I had it moved out, and to this day, I have never had a piano in my house again. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I'm talking to myself out loud. Look, look, Harold, you're getting with these guys are going to be here tomorrow. Why don't you write a couple of string quartets? And I did, and one of them was um, Three Faces West for Billy Al Bengston. And the other was uh, It's Deeper Near the Roses for David Sylvian. So I did that, and I thought to myself, well, this is, you know, this is very pleasurable because 
this is so different from anything else I've ever done uh, since, since I was a student in school. But as a, you know, as a person in the real world, it's certainly brand new for me. And I love doing it. And I've, I've done it some more. And I, in fact, I am just working now on a full CD of string quartet music. Oh, that would be incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. Imagine that. Wow. I couldn't be, I, I, I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> now, how, how do you... I'm, I'm absolutely stunned. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you're in a renaissance right now? Like you're reinventing yourself? or? or... I'm not sure. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. You know, it doesn't come naturally to me. I have to really think about things and work on them, which is uh, okay. You know, I can do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, I am most concerned at the moment with uh, how the string quartets are going to sound. You know, for the most part, string quartet music is not an attractive idea to me because of the uh, the, the the sound, especially of the high high sounds of the two violins, which to me kind of grate on my nerves. They're kind of screechy. And I don't like that at all. And Mm. I tend to, you know, like uh, if you would, for example, if if you had heard the uh, uh, dry mix of the string quartets uh, on In the Mist, you would see how radically I had changed um, in the studio. And so I could tolerate it. So that's what I'm working on now. That's interesting. I'm hacking away at it. In fact, I'll be done this weekend. I'll be finished this weekend. Congratulations. And and I've got 15, 15 string quartets, short ones, you know, like... Little, little brief ones. But what labels that can be released on? Darla, I think it's called? Oh, Darla, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yeah. Yes, it is. Darla, Darla, Darla is, is the one that's responsible for that. He said, why don't you do a whole album of string quartets? I said, well, yes, I will. Hmm. And I did. I find that strange that you don't have a piano in your house. I don't. I'm the... so happy it's not there. When I When I got rid of the piano... I replaced it. I re- replaced that space with a Navajo rug, and every morning for at least a year, when I got up first thing in the morning, walked into the kitchen, looked out into the living room, and I saw that rug, and I thought to myself, "Thank God that goddamn piano is not here." <laughs> the, the, um, I, I I could be reading into this, but do you have some sort of um, uh, how should I put it? Um, anxiety towards the piano? It's ugly. <laughs> it, 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 it's totally, it, it's totally aesthetic. It's an ugly, it's an ugly piece of furniture. I mean, seriously ugly. And I don't want it in my house. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, are you, uh, are you a spiritual person? If you don't mind no. me asking, no way. Eh? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure if this is some sort of. Buddhist Zen thing, or not? No, absolutely not. Okay. Have utterly no interest in that sort of thing at all. One thing I've always loved about this, sorry, this is the final question. Um, you and Brian and Eno both have like great song titles. Like I, I know that I, I love his title of "A Measured Room," or mm-hmm. for example, on your last album, "Sun at Six Windows" or "Mars." <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you where that comes from. First of all, it sounds really good. It does. But in fact, I, I have a house in the desert where I also live. I, I live in, in two places. Um, and I, I, share, I share a house here in South Pasadena. And I split time with uh, another house I've had for eight years out in uh, Joshua Tree near the, uh, near the famous monument. And uh, that place in the desert has six windows, and the sun, as it as it changes position, 
during the year. Uh, so I, I get sunlight and shadows uh, slowly changing over over a period of time. And I thought, wow, what a nice place to be. I like this. So <laughs> sun at six windows. That's a good one. It is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very proud of that title. <laughs> Listen, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, you are so welcome. Thank you as well. <laughs>